My aim by the end of this video is for you to know a lot more about this, the Porsche 7-speed PDK double clutch transmission that was fitted to most Porsche sports cars from about 2008 to the present. It's not a video for the mechanic, but one for the average car lover who just wants to learn. The video will be broken down into numerous sections. For each, I'll start at the very basics and move through to some pretty technical details, but without going completely crazy. I'll use a bunch of diagrams and then for each section I'll go to the transmission to show you what it looks like on the real thing. The entire video is going to be pretty long, so I've broken it down into two parts. This first part will cover clutches and gear set. Part two will cover lubrication, cooling, electrics and the valve body. And by the end, I'm hopeful that you will know a lot more about the magic that's going on in the back end of a Porsche sports car. First, a little background. The PDK is a double clutch transmission that is manufactured by ZF in Germany. It was initially installed in the 987 and 997 cars for the 2009 models. And whilst it's had some minor changes since, it is fundamentally the same transmission that is also installed in the 981, 991 and 718. Even though ZF make transmissions for many car manufacturers, this double clutch transmission is licensed to Porsche only. As a result of this, unlike most other transmissions manufactured by ZF, there is very little information or parts available. And so it has existed under a veil of secrecy for many years. For many simple repairs, the Porsche solution is to buy a new transmission, an unnecessary waste of money and simply not required in the vast majority of cases. Some might know I own two 981s, one to drive and another to strip down as a learning tool and make videos to help others. As part of this teardown project, a very generous individual from Sydney, Australia contacted me and offered me a PDK transmission for teardown as it had been damaged in a track accident. And so started another project, which was to strip the transmission down and make videos to provide as much information as I could for people who needed help with repairs. I've been helping people and workshops for a while now, but I thought I'd do something a little different, which is to make a video for anyone interested that explains how this amazing piece of engineering works. So what is a double clutch transmission? It's regularly described as a cross between a manual and an automatic transmission. The gear set is pretty much identical to a manual transmission, but the clutch pack and automation of operation is very close to that of a normal automatic. So to start, let's look at the clutch pack. What is a clutch? Simply, a clutch is a way of connecting or disconnecting a rotating shaft so that the opposing shaft can either not rotate or rotate when the two are joined, like this simple depiction of a dry clutch that is typical on a manual transmission. As the plates are pushed together, the engine rotation is transferred to the transmission shaft and so it begins to turn. The PDK uses a different type of clutch. These are a multi-plate wet clutch. This means there are alternating discs that are splined or locked to both the outer part, in this case connected to the engine, and the inner part which is connected to the transmission shaft. In this case here, the engine can turn freely without the transmission shaft turning. But if pressure is applied so the discs slide sideways and are held hard against each other, then the engine and transmission shaft are now locked together and the transmission shaft turns. If they are completely locked together, then the engine and transmission shaft turn at the same speed. But the pressure applied to the clutch discs can be regulated so that slip between the discs is created. An example of this is when you start moving from a stop and you need gradual take up of the clutch for smooth acceleration. Clutch slip is deliberately used at different times during transmission operation. If you've ever driven a PDK equipped car, when you release the brake and not put your foot on the accelerator, the car will smoothly accelerate to about five kilometers per hour and hold this, much like how a standard automatic behaves when you release the brake. In this situation, the clutch is being constantly slipped as the engine RPM in first gear is too high for this speed. So the clutch is slipped so the car doesn't crawl along at too high a speed. Whilst transmission fluid is used to actuate the clutch, this fluid is also used to cool and lubricate. A separate flow of lubrication and cooling fluid begins at the hub and flows through the pack to the outside. 
This gives much better wear resistance when there is slip between the discs and also cools the entire pack as there are slots in the disc that allow fluid flow through the clutch pack even when they are clamped together. In a double clutch transmission, there are two of these clutches that are nested into a single pack. Each of these clutches is connected to one of the two transmission shafts. The long transmission shaft is located inside the short shaft. The large clutch called clutch 1 is connected to the long inner shaft and the small clutch, clutch 2, is connected to the short outer shaft. Note that the arrangement of the clutches in the pack is different to what I've depicted here. I've done this for simplicity so you can easily see the two clutches. So let's now have a look at the clutch pack and the components and how it all fits together. Firstly, you will notice that the bell housing of the transmission has been cracked open. PDKs don't normally look like this. It's the result of the track accident and is how I became the recipient of the donation. This is the clutch pack. Please excuse how rusty it is. It had been sitting around the previous owner's shed for a while. At the front is the cover that's pressed onto the clutch with a bearing so that the cover remains stationary when the clutch turns. This knob at the front, which is part of the clutch pack itself, is locked into the flywheel, which is the output from the engine. So whenever the engine is turning, the cover remains stationary, but this entire outer part of the clutch will be turning with the engine. When the clutch pack is removed, you can see both input shafts that turn independently of each other. Looking at the clutch pack itself when turned over, you can see the passages where fluid is ported to activate each clutch. When I turn it over and then remove the front face that I've had cut off, we can see what's inside. This first piece is the inner part of the large clutch that fits into the inner input shaft. With this removed, you can see the same part, but for the smaller clutch, which is fitted into the outer input shaft. With this removed, you can now see the two clutch packs themselves. First thing to notice is how for both clutch packs, the steel discs are locked into the outer clutch pack housing, and the friction discs would be locked into the inner clutch pieces I've removed. Each of the packs themselves can be removed. Clutch one can be simply turned over and the pack falls out, and you can see the alternating steel and friction discs. Also note the friction disc grooves that are there to allow fluid flow through the discs. Clutch pack two can be removed after this snap ring is removed. This snap ring is what the clutch pack compresses against when activated and is very typical of a standard automatic clutch pack design. Clutch one doesn't have a snap ring as it compresses against the clutch front face, which has been cut off here. When the packs themselves are removed, you can see the activation pistons that are used to activate each clutch. Each piston isn't a circle, but an annular shape with a large O-ring on the inner and outer surfaces for sealing where it slides up and down. Each also has a large spring that pushes the piston back down when pressure is released. Only the spring for clutch one is visible here. Here I'm applying compressed air to each of the fluid ports on the other side to simulate clutch activation. Clutch one, and now clutch two. The clutch itself is installed in the transmission into this piece, called the intermediate plate, which is normally bolted to the transmission behind the clutch pack. It has many channels machined into it that port fluid to where it's needed from the valve body. I'll cover the valve body and fluid flow later. You can see here the channels where fluid is ported to each clutch on the other side once the clutch pack is installed. So if I fit the intermediate plate into the housing, for this I've removed all the clutch discs so I can turn each part freely, I can now fit the clutch pack casing, which is the part that fits into the rear of the engine and will always be turning if the engine is. Notice that neither input shaft will be turning. I can now fit the inner part of clutch two which locks into input shaft two. When I turn this piece, it is now turning shaft two. I can now fit the inner part of clutch one, which locks into shaft one. I can also turn it independently of the outer casing and the engine, but if I simulate locking the clutch discs, you can now see how the engine rotation is now rotating the transmission input shaft. Let's now talk about gearing, and we'll start with the basics. The gears in the PDK are identical to what is found in a manual gearbox. You have one gear that is on the input shaft and another that is on the main shaft, which is the output. One of these gears, the larger of the two, will always have a bearing on the inside so it can rotate relative to the shaft. 
This is called the loose gear. The opposing gear will be permanently fixed to the shaft. This is called the fixed gear. In this example, you can see the input shaft on the left has the fixed gear. So whenever the input shaft is turned, this gear will turn. When the input shaft is turned, the loose gear on the right will also turn, but the main shaft won't because the gear can turn freely because of the bearing. To make the main shaft turn, the loose gear needs to be locked to the main shaft. I'll explain how this is done in a moment. So each ratio in the transmission is a pair of gears, one loose and one fixed. Depending on the ratio, the large gear might be on the input shaft, so this gear to shaft locking needs to occur here, but the mechanism to do this is the same regardless of the shaft. Whilst I said each gear ratio is a pair, reverse is different. It has three gears. The two on the input and main shafts don't mesh, and there is a third called an idler gear that is installed between them, so the main shaft rotation is reversed from all the other forward gears. The ratio between the input and main shaft is determined by the number of teeth on each. For example, in first gear, the input side has 11 teeth, and the output side 43 teeth, giving a ratio of 3.909. This means the input shaft will turn 3.909 times to make the main shaft turn once. If you've ever looked at gear ratios and wondered why they're these funny numbers, it's because of a concept called hunting tooth ratios. I won't go into too much detail, but enough said that it's undesirable to have the tooth number on each gear be such that the same tooth regularly meshes with a corresponding tooth on the other gear. This will have the gear teeth wear poorly and unevenly, and will cause added vibration and noise. So the teeth numbers on each are chosen carefully, often using prime numbers to avoid this problem. Hence why we get these strange ratio numbers. Let's talk about how a loose gear is locked to the shaft. I'll first explain using graphics and then I'll go to the transmission. Next to each loose gear there is a hub which is locked hard to the shaft. On the outside of this is a sliding sleeve that has splines that allow it to slide sideways but will continue to turn with the hub. On the loose gear there are extra small teeth around the outside called dog teeth. To lock the gear to the shaft, the sleeve is moved sideways and locks into the dog teeth, with the result being the gear is now locked to the shaft. The problem with this is that the loose gear is rarely at the same rotational speed as the shaft, so without ensuring the gear and shaft are co-speed prior to engagement, the dog teeth will be worn or broken off very quickly. This is where the synchronizer steps in, which is the orange ring shown here that sits between the gear and the hub and is used to ensure the slider and gear are exactly the same speed prior to engagement. So how does it work? The inside part of the synchronizer is a conical shape and is designed to fit into a corresponding conical part of the loose gear. This inside surface has a friction material on it. The synchronizer also has teeth on it, similar to the dog teeth on the gear. There is also this piece here called a strut. This is a piece that has a small metal ball and spring, and a small notch in the slider that holds the ball's position. So when the slider is moved sideways, the metal ball takes the strut with it, which in turn pushes the synchronizer sideways. When the friction material on the synchronizer comes into contact with the corresponding surface of the gear, this changes the speed of the gear to match it. Because of the slight looseness of the synchronizer ring, its teeth will be misaligned with the slider until the two are exactly the same speed. At this time, the slider is able to move fully sideways and slide over the synchronizer teeth and engage the dog teeth of the gear. When this happens, the strut ball moves downward out of the notch, allowing the strut to jump back into its original position. While this might seem a little confusing, when I go to the transmission and show a shift, this should become more clear. Also, in the largest of the gears selected, this being first, second, third, and reverse, there are triple synchronizers used. For these, there are three synchronizer rings all nested together rather than one. It's like the clutches we previously looked at, where there are three discs rather than one. The reason is, these gears themselves are much larger and heavier than the others, so the rotational inertia of the spinning loose gear is larger when using the synchronizer to change the gear speed when selecting. The basic principle of how it works, though, is unchanged. 
To move the slider, a shift fork and shift rod are used. Also in the PDK, unlike a manual transmission, each shift rod has a magnet attached that is used for detection of the shifter position. Finally, each slider is able to engage two possible gears. It will sit between the two and depending on the direction the slider is moved, it will engage one or the other. Note that there are eight gears in total in the PDK, seven forward gears and one reverse. So there are four shift rods in total, each of which can select two possible gears. Note also that when you change gears in a manual transmission, this movement either forward or back of the shift rod is exactly what you are doing when you move the gear stick. In the PDK, however, this is done automatically using the transmission fluid and the valve body, which I'll cover later. So let's look at the transmission. Here it is with the rear casing removed. Things to see here are the four shift rods and magnets attached that are used to detect shift positions. These two, shift rods one and four, are for the gears at the front of the transmission that can't be seen. Shift rod three is for first gear and third gear, and shift rod two is for fifth and seventh. Currently, there is no gear selected, and if I turn the input shaft that is connected to all of these, you will see the fixed gears that are locked to the input shaft, first and third will turn, but seventh and fifth don't turn because they are loose gears with bearings. Notice the selector hub for fifth and seventh turns because this is locked to the input shaft. I'll put the transmission on its end so it's easier to see, and we'll look more closely at fifth gear right at the end. I can remove the fixed gear on the main shaft by sliding it off. You can see the splines that lock it to the shaft. The gear on the input shaft can now turn freely on the bearing below. If I move the slider to engage the gear, you can now see that the gear is locked to the input shaft, and so the input shaft turns. You can also see that the other fixed gears turn and the associated loose gears, but the output shaft doesn't turn as I've removed the associated fixed gear. If I now replace the gear on the main shaft and turn, fifth gear is fully engaged and the main shaft turns. Let's look more closely at the loose gear and synchronizer operation. Note, the diagrams that I used before had everything spaced out far more for demonstration. The synchronizer movement is actually far less, maybe a millimeter. As you can see here, the loose gear spins freely, and if I pull it off, you can see the bearing underneath and the synchronizer ring. You can see the conical surface of the gear and also the corresponding synchronizer surface with its friction material. These are the two surfaces that grip each other to change the speed of the loose gear. Here is a closer look at the strut with the ball out of where it should be and me fitting it correctly by compressing the spring and pushing into place. With the slider moved out of position, you can see the detent that holds the metal ball and moves the strut when the slider is moved. If I put everything back into the central position and move the slider slightly, you can see the strut being moved with it due to the ball being stuck in the notch. And if I replace the synchronizer and simulate the initial part of shift rod movement, you can see the synchronizer being lifted. Notice the blocking teeth of the synchronizer and also this part that will be pushed by the strut. With the synchronizer in place, you can see that the width of this part is slightly narrower than the gap for the strut. So if I simulate this synchronizer ring being dragged around by the gear that is spinning, you can see the blocking teeth of the synchronizer are misaligned with the slider teeth, so the slider can't move further. Only when the gear and slider are the same speed does this allow the slider pressure to push the blocking teeth back slightly, which would then allow the slider to pass over it. And if I now fit the gear and spin it, you can see again the blocking teeth moving sideways due to the friction with the synchronizer, which again is what is blocking slider movement until the speeds are the same. So to show a gear being selected, I'll select seventh with fifth removed, so you can see it a little more easily. When I start moving the slider, you can see the strut move, and with it is pushed the synchronizer ring underneath it. When the gear is the same speed, it then allows all the teeth to align and the slider moves to fully engage the dog teeth with the strut jumping back to its original position. Now let's look at what makes a double clutch transmission special. 
Firstly, let's consider a very simple transmission that isn't a DCT and only two gears, first and second. To select first gear, you need to depress the clutch pedal to disengage it, select the gear, then re-engage the clutch. To change gears to second, you need to disengage the clutch, select the gear, then again engage the clutch. Whilst this is a thoroughly enjoyable process for the enthusiast, it takes time to shift and requires a level of skill and coordination. If we now consider the double clutch transmission and a very simple one where we have these two gears first and second, but on different input shafts and hence different clutches. If first is selected, second can also be selected. Clutch one will initially be engaged to start moving the car. And when the shift to second gear is commanded, this is simply a case of swapping the clutch that is engaged. In the split second that it takes to change the clutch over, the engine RPM will be rapidly changed during the shift so the engine and required new input shaft speed are close prior to the new clutch being engaged. The shift speed, which is simply a case of how quickly one clutch is disengaged and the other engaged, is very much determined by drive mode of the car. If you're my wife and pottering around town in drive, this shift is relatively slow and soft. But if you select the sports driving mode and drive aggressively, the shifts are super quick and sharp and will sometimes have both clutches engaged slightly during the changeover. In the end, you have an automatic transmission with very direct drive characteristics like a manual transmission, but with the added benefit of very responsive and super quick shifts. If we now put third gear in place, the shift rod can be moved to select this gear in preparation for third to be commanded by the transmission control unit or TCU. This process of anticipating the next gear is called pre-selection and is the TCU predicting the next gear that will be used. In this case where second gear is engaged, the next gear could be either first or third and is generally predicted by the TCU based on if you are accelerating or decelerating. Sometimes, if it's out of ideas when neither accelerating nor decelerating, the TCU won't pre-select the gear and will wait for the driver to show their intentions prior to doing so. So, if we build up the transmission, we add fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and finally reverse. The reverse idle gear is shown in pink here. Everything is spaced out here for clarity, but in the transmission it is packed in much more tightly. So you can see that all the even gears, three in total, are on shaft and clutch two at the front of the transmission, and all the odd gears in reverse, five gears in total, are on shaft and clutch one at the rear. Whilst it might seem strange to have five gears on one clutch and three on the other, Reverse and first are put on clutch one as the larger clutch is preferable for starting from a stop. To move the shift rods, there is a cylinder and piston at the front of each. Transmission fluid can be sent to either side of each piston so the shift rod can be moved forward or back depending on the gear being engaged. There is also a clever gear lockout system in the transmission which mechanically prohibits some gears from being selected when others are. There are notches in the shift rods and a metal pin that sits between to stop the other shift rod from moving. So if the bottom shift rod is moved to select a gear, you can see how now the pin stops the other shift rod from being able to. In this way, if first or third is selected, it's impossible to select fifth or seventh. If second or reverse is selected, it's impossible to select fourth or sixth. And if reverse is selected, it's impossible to select any forward gear. Here are these lockout pins in the transmission between shift rods one and four. Now between shift rods two and three and the pins that lock out reverse from all the others are these two and also the one down the bottom here. Here I'm selecting reverse and you can see the two upper pins move to lock out another selection. For each of the shift rods, there is also a spring-loaded pin that holds the central position if no gear is selected. If the transmission was for a front engine and rear wheel drive car, the main shaft would be the output to the wheels. This is the case for four wheel drive versions for the 911 as this would go to the front wheels. But in all Porsche sports car applications that are either mid or rear engine, the drive shafts come out from the side of the transmission. To achieve this, there is another fixed gear attached to the main shaft, which turns what is called a pinion shaft. This pinion shaft then turns the differential, which in turn rotates the half shafts 
that then rotate the wheels. In some transmissions, this ratio between the main shaft and pinion shaft can be changed to get a change in final ratio across all gears. The base 2.7 litre 981 transmission is an example of this. The ratio here is lower, which in turn lowers every gear in the transmission. I'm assuming this is done for this low power engine to give better acceleration at low speeds at the expense of top end speed. And finally, on the pinion shaft there is the park wheel. This is a wheel with very large notches in it that's used to lock the pinion shaft and hence not allow the car to move when park is selected. A cable from the gear shift lever in the cabin attaches to another lever on the side of the transmission, which in turn pushes a pawl up into the park wheel when park is selected, and lowers this when you select any gear other than park. So let's look at this on the transmission. Firstly, let's look at the pinion shaft. Here is the fixed gear on the shaft. You can't see the opposing gear on the main shaft as it's hidden back here. If I turn the output shaft, you can see now the pinion shaft turns. Also, here is the park gear with the large notches in it. I haven't fitted it as it needs to be installed when the gear set is installed into the main casing. When we look at the rear casing, you can see the park lock mechanism, which is the same for pretty much any automatic transmission. Here, the shaft protrudes out the side of the transmission and is attached via a cable to the gear shift lever in the cabin. I'll put the park wheel where it would be located when installed. It will turn freely if park isn't selected. But if I simulate selecting park, this piece is pushed forward to lift up the pawl and engage the park wheel. If the pawl doesn't line up exactly, there is this spring mechanism back here that then allows the pawl to sit lower until the wheel turns so the notches line up and then it locks into place. This is exactly what is happening when you select park and the car moves slightly and then locks into park. Here you can see a lot of the transmission parts installed, but the things to notice are the half shafts that come from the differential that lives in here. The half shafts can be removed easily and then the differential can be seen under the cover on the side. When the cover is removed, the differential falls out and then we can easily see the end of the pinion shaft, the bevel gear, which turns the differential. I'll now fit the reverse idler gear, but before I do so, here are the reverse gears. Whilst it looks like these gears are very close to each other, they don't actually touch. If I fit the idler gear and then turn the input shaft, you can now see how this makes the reverse gear on the main shaft turn in the opposite direction of all the others. Also notice that every gear is turning. I've engaged fifth gear at the back, but what it shows is that whenever the car is being driven, Every gear in the transmission is turning, even though only one pair of gears is fully engaged with an engaged clutch. At the front of the transmission, there will be another gear pre-selected that will have all these gears driven by the main shaft. So there is always a mad frenzy of spinning gears inside the transmission, especially at high engine RPM and high speed. At the front of the transmission, I'll remove the intermediate plate and now you can see the four shift pistons and cylinders. I remove the piston and you can see the two seals that allow pressure to be applied from either side. When the piston was fitted, the fluid pressure on this side of the piston came via channels in the intermediate plate we removed before. To get fluid to the far side of the piston, it comes from the channels like this one that then feed to the rear part of the cylinder back here. And if I fit all the cylinders and pistons when the gear set has been removed from the front casing, you can see how the pistons screw into the end of the shift rod and then fit inside the cylinder. That concludes part one. Part two will cover lubrication, cooling, electrics, and the valve body. If you are looking for more detailed information on the transmission, go to my channel and there is a playlist with many more videos that contain a lot more information. Thanks for watching.